Uh, and now can we have a round of applause for Terence Edwards and his talk, The Connected House of Horrors. Good afternoon, EMF. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming here. My name is Terence Eden. Um, I need to tell you uh, three things uh, about this talk. So the first thing is that uh, this does contain some mention of uh, sex and death. If that's not for you, that's all right. Uh, please go to one of the other talks. That, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I, for everyone else, I assume you have parental permission to be here. Uh, the second thing is, this is a personal talk. It doesn't reflect the views of my employers, past, present, or future. And the third thing to say is this is all absolutely true. Everything that I'm going to tell you today is true. I've not exaggerated it for comic effect. This, uh, a lot of this comes from my life, um, and citations are available on request. So um, I've been building smart home things for, I guess, about 10 years now. And, you know, from automated plug sockets to really quite complex interplays with different things within my house. And let me tell you, it is an absolute nightmare. It, it is one of the worst things that I have ever done. And I encourage you not to go into the field of smart homes. It will ruin your life. Um, I'm, I'm going to start uh, talking you through some of the kit that I've got and, and why it is so terrible. Um, so the, uh, the first thing, which I think most of us here will have, give me a cheer if you've got a, uh, a smart TV. Of course. Give me a cheer if you read the end user license agreement which came with your TV. <laughs> Liar. Uh, no one does. No one does. I'm sorry, no one does. Now, this is, this is interesting. Smart TVs offer us something really quite cool. So if you've got um, iPlayer or YouTube or 4OD, whatever it is, you're making a uh, trade-off. You're getting the convenience of watching whatever you want, whenever you want. But the privacy trade-off is someone now actually knows what it is you watch, when you watch it, which bits you rewind and watch again and again, which bits you fast forward through. Now, maybe that's an OK trade-off. You know, you get hopefully better quality TV. And in exchange, you give away your demographic data, because what you're watching says uh, a lot about you. Um, but things start getting slightly dicey. And the, uh, the reason I know that so few people read the end user license agreements of their TVs is uh, a few years ago, Samsung released a smart TV which had a microphone in it. And you can bark at your TV. You can say, volume up. Turn to channel seven, but whatever it is. Uh, but buried deep in the end user license agreement was this wonderful sentence. Um, Please be aware that if your spoken words include personal or other sensitive information, that information will be among the data captured and transmitted to a third party through your, voice of, uh, through your use of voice recognition. Anything you say in front of your TV can and will be used against you. Um, and this is not you know, a sort of a theoretical concern. Samsung, I think, put out a, uh, a press release saying people should just try to avoid uh, having sensitive conversations in front of their TV. I mean, can you imagine? Do not argue with your spouse in front of the TV, otherwise you will start seeing adverts for divorce lawyers. I mean, that's, that's basically what they're saying. And we, we sort of, we just blindly put these things in our homes and with microphones and all sorts of things, and, and they listen to us. But oh my goodness, they do so much more. And it, it is uh, quite dreadful. Uh, there is a company called uh, Vizio, who didn't just look at you know, what iPlayer stuff you were, were looking at. They analyzed the video feed of everything that you put through your TV. So from the HDMI, they could tell what DVD you were watching by sampling the video feed and could then sell that to advertisers. And they were fined $2.2 million for this sort of gross privacy violation. Because you, know, you think, oh, if I'm getting a DVD or a Blu-ray, putting it in, no one's going to know. Well, it turns out they do. And again, you can extract an awful lot of data about someone, about their, their tastes, their habits, their sexuality, uh, their age all sorts of things from what videos they watch. And then this is just being uh, sent back to advertisers and, and who knows where. I think that's, that's a really weird privacy trade-off. I, I mean, we joke, you know, in, in Soviet Russia, you don't watch TV. TV watches you. It's, it's now a reality. And your smart TV is probably doing that. Um, the, these aren't a toy that I have, but I love these. These are cloud pets. They're just $39.99 plus $6.99 shipping and handling. Um, and they're magical. 
Um, so that you're, you're a high-powered business executive and you don't, can't be bothered to see your kid. So you give them a cloud pet, and while you're out on the road at a Hilton hotel or wherever, you, you speak into the cloud pet app and you say, uh, oh, I love you very much, or whatever it is people say to their kids. Uh, and the kid hugs the toy, and your voice comes out of the toy. Oh my god, that's so cute, it's so cool. Um, but the people who designed cloud pets just I mean, the only way I can put it is they, they just didn't know that security was a thing. Um, and it turns out that if uh, you, could, you, yeah, you could go onto um, a, an unsecured website that they had and just look at all the recordings that people had left for their kids. That's not creepy at all, is it? Or all the recordings kids had left for their parents. Or you could inject your own recordings into someone else's cloud pet. Send me Bitcoin, send me Bitcoin. Um, it's just... <laughs> It's just awful. And, you know, the, this company sort of said, oh, well, the security fears are overblown, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, my goodness. I, I don't think these are on sale anymore, which is probably a good thing. But lots of people are training their kids to be complicit in their own privacy violations. And I think that's a, um, a bad lesson to teach kids. I don't know. I'm, uh, so um, I used to drive a BMW, but I'm, I'm much better now. Um, this is the... Um, <laughs> Oh, it's worse. This, this was the electric BMW, because I'm a cool eco-hippie. Um, so this is uh, the BMW i3. Um, this, is, this is not a car. This is a computer that you put your body inside. Uh, this has a permanent 3G connection. Um, now, BMW used to have an API for their cars, so you could do cool things like uh, unlock them and uh, sound the horn from their, from their, uh, uh, from their app. But they, they sort of locked that down. Um, but... What do hackers do when we're told that we're not allowed to do something? Hack the mainframe! Um, so I decompiled the app. Uh, now, BMW engineers obviously didn't feel that security was, was a thing. So uh, it didn't do any certificate pinning or any checking like that. So I was able to extract the certificate from the app. And now I could control uh, my car from my Raspberry Pi. That's probably secure. That's probably fine. Um, now. The other thing, so I said, you know, you're, you're putting your body in a computer. Let me refine that because it gets worse. You're putting your body in an unpatched Linux box. Now, now I know what you're thinking. How do I know that it is an unpatched Linux, Linux box? Well, in the infotainment system, if you press the right buttons, it will say parts of this system are licensed under the GPL. So I wrote an email to BMW and said, Yo, my car's like, it's got GPL and stuff. Can I have your source codes? And they went, oh, no one's ever asked for us for that. Uh, here is a DVD with the source code to our car on it, um, which I've uploaded to GitHub, so you can take a look at that. And it's, <laughs> oh, 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 mm, it's not good. It's really not good. I mean, you know, I, I love Linux. Uh, some of my best friends run Linux, but I'm not sure I want to put my body in an unpatched Linux machine. And it gets worse. If you want to update uh, your car's firmware, the, the 3G connection isn't strong enough or fast enough or, or whatever, um, don't worry, BMW will just mail you out a USB stick to just plug into your car to update it. So we're, they're now teaching people that, hey, if you get a random USB stick in the mail, it's fine to just plug into your car. Nothing could possibly, it must be official. It's got the word BMW stenciled on it. Um, it gets worse, it just gets worse and worse. So um, having lots of IoT stuff in my house is quite expensive, so I thought I need some security cameras. Uh, so, so I got these, these are sort of cheap Chinese security cameras, and they're, you know, they're basically fine. They, they display an image and I can see it on my phone. Um, but the, the company that I bought them through who sort of managed a platform for viewing them went, went bust. So I can't, I've paid good money for these and I can't, I, they didn't go bust, they, they stopped offering the services. And so I, so I couldn't use them anymore, which, which was really unfortunate. And so I, I ended up with these sort of lumps of plastic, which I can't do. So I'm going to teach you now how to hack almost any security camera. Now this is really technical. So if you want to take notes, that's absolutely fine. So what you are going to need is a paper clip. You're gonna unbend the paper clip by exactly 90 degrees and just shove it in that reset hole in the back. Just hold it down for 30 seconds and boom, the, these cameras unlock. So uh, once I did that, they were unlocked from the manufacturer um, and uh, we're, we're gonna do a little quiz. So the default username for all of these cameras was administrator. Can anyone guess what the default password was? <laughs> Shout it out. Password. Oh. It was one, two, three, oh, it's good. Um, that, that, of course, was a trick question. There was no password. <laughs> so, 
So I've reset the cameras, and I can then do a firmware dump, and I can see that these are running an outdated version of Linux, and I write to the company and say, hey, there's Linux in my cameras. Can I have your source? And they went, no. Um, but that's all right, because I, I downloaded it. Um, someone else, I stuck it online. Someone else decompiled it, and they went, oh, I found the default Telnet password in here. So now I have root over my cameras, which is really handy, because the only way to configure them is using IE7, uh, which is... I'm not joking. It, it just gets worse and worse. And you know, you can reset more or less any security camera. So this, um, uh, the one on the left there, uh, that's an external security camera, and that has a, a pin on it. So if you see someone's security camera, there is a good chance there is a little hole which just says reset. You know, I mean, hmm, it's not good, is it? it and it, it gets worse. It just gets worse and worse. So um, uh, uh, Matthew Garrett gave a brilliant talk about uh, Wi-Fi light bulbs. Um, uh, the other day. I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi light switches, which are infinitely worse. Um, so the, the thing about um, light switches is, so I, I've got one of these complicated things in, in my kitchen where it's like a bank of four bulbs and a bank of four, and I can't afford to replace all eight bulbs with, with like LifeX. I, I mean, I, I can because I, I found some bugs in the LifeX firmware, and they just emailed me a bunch for free. But um, assuming I hadn't, a light switch is actually really good. This is a, a Lanbon one. They sell this, uh, sold this on Amazon, um, it's sort of interesting, you wire it in, you connect it to your Wi-Fi, and I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder how it works, how does this Wi-Fi, how does this Wi-Fi light switch work? Um, so, you know, it, it, again, there's, there's no real security on it, there's no certificate pinning, so uh, I stuck up a little proxy and found out what it does, and so once you've installed this onto your network, it makes a permanent connection to an IP address in China. Um, that's, that's probably fine. Um, <laughs> Who, who among us doesn't have a, yeah. Um, and I thought, well, what's, what's this server running? So, you know, I, I did a sort of net stat on it, and the, the server that my light switch connects to runs Microsoft Windows. Vista. <laughs> I'm sure it's secure. I'm sure it is secure. Um, and the, the, the way that the app works, again, I sort of decompiled the app. There's no security. All it does is the app sends the serial number of your light switch to this server in China, and the server in China goes this. And the serial number is only like seven digits long, so you could just enumerate through all of them and just turn on and off random people's light switches. It's um, no, no offense. I mean, you shouldn't do that. That's, that's bad and naughty, but you could, and that, that's terrifying. And it, it, just gets, it just gets worse and worse. So th there was an Android app um, that, uh, that comes with these light switches, and for some reason, it, it wasn't allowed on the Google Play Store, uh, so I had to download it from a sort of non-SSL site uh, in China. And these are the permissions that my light switch app asked me for. Oh, it's just, it's too many. It's just, what, why does my light switch need to make premium rate phone calls? <laughs> I mean, it, I, so some of them, location, so if I move out of a geofence area, it can turn the lights on and off, but record audio, modify the contents of my story. It's a light switch. It doesn't need to do these things. Um, and yeah, the, this was just, these were sold for, I think, 20 or 30 quid uh, on Amazon. And I, I think this is part of the problem, is that a lot of the IoT stuff, a lot of the home automation stuff we buy is cheap. And th there's no business model in supporting it once you've, you've bought it. You know, you've paid the 30 quid, um, and that, that's it. They, they don't really care about you anymore. And I'd, I'd like to say it's because it's cheap, but you know, with that, the BMW i3 is an expensive car, um, and BMW are not doing regular firmware updates for it. Uh, although maybe that's a good thing. Do I want to be driving around in something which has only just been tested? I don't know. Um, but it gets worse. So this is the Nest smoke alarm, uh, and it is without a doubt one of the worst uh, smart home things that I've got. So th the first thing is I... Um, it, it just eats batteries, and I sort of put in a bunch of AA batteries, and it started complaining that I had given it the wrong brand of batteries. And it's like, I have never met something which was so fussy. It needed to be energizer, lithium, something. Or, ugh. But again, lots of these smart home things are designed for single people living uh, solitary lives. So. Um, when, when I started this, you know, I had an account on my phone and I could see what my smoke alarm was doing, but there was no way to give any of my other family members 
uh, an account on my smoke alarm so that they could know when the house is burning down, which, which they might want to know. The only way I could do it was by giving them the same username and password. And th there's a whole thing. And I do kind of think that lots of these IoT things are designed by sort of bros in Silicon Valley who, you know, just live by themselves because no one likes them. And, and so, you know, it is, you know, and like with light switch apps, it's quite often, you know, you, there is one app and, you know, no one else in the house can have it. Um, there's also some really dodgy stuff with this home automation stuff where it starts to get used for domestic abuse uh, as well. So, you, you know, you can say, well, uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, what the password to the lights is. I control the lights in the house and you don't. And that can get very abusive. Um, and I, I find that very weird and strange. Um, but the, the, the thing about the Nest, the reason why I hated it, I was on holiday and I thought, I'm, j oh, I'm just a little paranoid. I'm going to check and see whether my house has burned down. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm uh, 100 miles away. What am I going to do if my house has burned down? So I opened up the app um, and this is what I saw. To continue using your Nest, you must agree to the terms of service, read the website privacy policy, the cookie policy, and the privacy statement. I agree. And, you know, it, I have bought this stuff. This is, this is my product. I have paid money for it. It is installed in my house. And I'm now being told, you cannot use this unless you read four legal documents and agree to them. Well, what, what if I don't agree to them? This, this thing that I have bought um, is no longer under my control. And I find that a bit troubling and strange that you know we we're now trusting companies who may go bust they may change their privacy policy i mean i'll be quite honest i couldn't be bothered to read four different privacy policies i just clicked i agree i have no idea what i've agreed to maybe this now means that nest can come in and wallpaper my house i don't know it would be lovely if they did but i don't think they will um and it just troubles me and it gets worse and and worse so um just give me a cheer if you've got a, an alexa or similar smart speaker thing you fools Fools. So um, we yeah, let, let's let's just stick a, a listening device in our in our living rooms. Why? Oh, we can order nachos quicker. Why? Right. Um, we're now entering this really weird phase of of human existence where you know um, society hasn't caught hasn't quite caught up with the 20th century, and some of us are living in the 21st century with, with gadgets. So when those of you who've got a smart speaker like this, when you have friends, assuming you have friends, uh, when you have friends who come over to your house, do you say, oh, by the way, there's something which might always be listening to you? Should you? Should, should you assume that they understand what it is? Should, do you need a privacy policy when someone comes around for, uh, for biscuits? Maybe you should. Just click a I agree on the doorbell to, to come in. Um, <laughs> I'm going to build an IoT doorbell which does that by pressing, the, yeah, uh, million dollar idea. Um, so things like the Echo, I, one of the reasons I find them a bit troubling, oh, there's many reasons. So one is we, we are teaching kids that they don't need to say please and thank you to this disembodied robotic female voice, uh, and, and this uh, robot woman will always do what you say. You don't need to say please and thank you. Um, but you know there are devices. We've bought them. They're in our houses. But they're not under our control. So I, I present to you a very interesting case which, which happened last year in the States. Um, Echo search warrant raises concerns. So um, this is a very sad story. Um, a guy uh, had some friends around, and one of them died, was found the next morning face down, drowned in the hot tub. And the police uh, uh, assumed that this was murder or foul play, um, and as well as searching the house and you know, doing all the normal stuff that police do, they went to Amazon and said, um, we have a, we've got a search warrant for this guy's Alexa. We want every single thing that he said. Uh, we want to hear what it was, what happened, any background noises like that. Is that okay? I, d I don't know if that's okay. I, I don't know whether, I, I don't know if that's legal, I, but I don't know whether it's socially acceptable. I, d I don't know how I feel about something that's in my house and if I make a casual joke about something is now recorded and maybe the police can get to it. Now, Amazon, to their credit, turned around and went, no, <laughs> no, we're not giving you. We will fight this in court. We, we want to protect our customers' privacy, um, which is nice. Um, and it, it looked like it might go courts and, you know, I object, overruled. Um, and the guy who was, uh, who's, Echo this was, who was accused, went, actually, no, um, I'd quite like the police to have it because I believe that my Echo will exonerate me. And how do I feel about having something listening in my home which may prove that I am not guilty of a crime? Um, and now, eventually, the, uh, the, the case was dropped. The, uh, the police, I, I think, realized that the guy had uh, 
drunk too much and then drowned, but it starts, it, tickle, it, it sort of rubs me up the wrong way that we have listening devices which may or may not be used against us. Um, and, and actually, it gets worse. They didn't necessarily need uh, the search warrant for the Echo, uh, because in a statement, um, another smart device, a smart device, his water heater, points to an exorbitant amount of water being used in the early morning hours, what investigators believe was an attempt to cover up a crime. So, you know, if you can take a look at your, if you've got a smart meter, a smart water meter, any of these smart devices which are constantly recording every single minute by minute what's going on in your home, which of those points to you being guilty of something? Um, and it gets worse, it just gets worse and worse. So um, I talked about computers that we put our bodies inside. What about the computers we put inside our bodies? Does anyone know what this is a, uh, an x-ray of? Pacemaker, excellent, well done. Um, so this um, is, is a sciencey term. It keeps your heart going, basically, um, and it's a little computer, uh, and that's cool. We've got little computers inside us now, but here's the problem with, with these things: is that they are usually built quite cheaply, and the companies which build them don't pay much attention to security. And what we find is that lots of these pacemakers, if you go online, you'll be able to find out what the default password is for them, and it is not a long password. And if you've got a laptop and an antenna you know, shoved into your USB port, you can start reading off pacemaker data from someone, and it gets worse. You can write data to the pacemaker as well. So, you know, usually what happens if the heart goes into, I'm, I'm not a, a medical doctor or any sort of doctor, but you know, once the heart goes a bit funny, the pacemaker can give it a little zap of electricity and you're still alive. You could, if you know the default password and you are close enough, reprogram someone's pacemaker so it doesn't provide that jolt of electricity, or that it provides too much, or something else. And it's really weird. The, the, these devices which are inside us are not under our control, that almost, well, not almost anyone, certainly anyone in this room would be able to go up and literally reprogram your heart. And it gets worse. Uh, this is another case. Uh, this guy said, um, I woke up and someone had set fire to my house, so I quickly packed my bags, jumped through the window. Oh, it was awful. Uh, and the p uh, police and fire went, oh, we think you did it, and we're going to subpoena your pacemaker data to find out whether you did it or not, Wh whether your heart activity was consistent with the story that you told us. Now, again, I, I don't necessarily want to get into whether this is, is legal in this jurisdiction or, or legal here, because I, I really don't know. But... It worried, there is a computer inside your body which is not only not under your control, will betray you if asked. It will give up your secrets. And that worries me, you know, because we are seeing more and more people, whether it's cochlear implants or neural implants or heart things or, you know, all sorts of, you know, crazy cool, amazing, look, we're rebuilding humanity, but there's a default password and any hacker on the internet can slurp, you know, what your heart was doing last night. It worries me, it really worries me, and um, it just gets worse, it gets worse and worse. So um, this is where we get to the, uh, the, the sort of juicy topic of, uh, of sex. Um, now, uh, we're gonna be talking uh, about teledildonics. Um, tele from the Greek word meaning distance, dildonics from the Greek word meaning an offensive slogan painted on the back of a camper van. Um, <laughs> it was the last one they had, I'm so sorry. Um, so, I, I, and I am not, I am not here to kink shame anyone. I, I am here to security shame some people. So, um, this is the Wii Vibe. Uh, this is a vibrator, uh, and it connects to your smartphone via Bluetooth. Uh, so far, so good. So you can control it from your phone, uh, and you can also uh, set up a, an account with someone else, and they can control your vibrator from their phone while they're in the comfort of their own bus or train seat or wherever they happen to be to, to control it, um, which, is, which is fine, that's good. But um, this, this uses Bluetooth, and um, that, that's not terrifically secure. Um, and what that means is if you know what the default pairing key is of this vibrator, you can just pick up your phone, scan, find them, connect, and activate it. You can commit serious sexual assault from your phone via Bluetooth. That's not funny. That, that, that this is a real problem, that people might be wearing these and thinking that only my trusted partner uh, or myself can use these, but in actual fact, anyone with a Bluetooth phone or a Bluetooth laptop can do it. 
Now, the other problem with this is that um, uh, we, we talked again. So um, give me a, a, a cheer if you've read the privacy policy on your vibrator. Liar. Um, no one does. If people had read the privacy policy on, on this vibrator, they would have realized that the, the company which uh, you know, manufactures this uh, takes diagnostic information. And so every time it's used, they get a record of where you were when you used it, how long you used it for, the intensity of the vibrations when you stopped using it, oh, and uh, your internal body temperature. Did, did anyone tick the box that says, yes, I consent to my internal body temperature being sent? Uh, I don't think so. And there, there's been lawsuits and all sorts over this. And it, it's, it's worrying and it's scary. And it gets, and it gets worse. Um, it gets so much worse. So um, this is a, uh, a, another internet-connected sex toy. And um, I know what some of you are thinking. Mine doesn't look like that. Well, well yours doesn't have a camera on the end, whereas this one does. Um, <laughs> No, 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 listen, what people want to do in the privacy of their own internet connection is, is their business. Um, but, sure, are you ready for your close-up? Um, now, you, you cannot stream um, HD video over Bluetooth, so uh, they've helpfully put a Wi-Fi logo on there. Now, Wi-Fi, as we know, has a fantastic range, you know, a couple of hundred meters, if you're lucky, and with good an uh, antennas. This does anten uh, attenuate somewhat if it is surrounded by a body, but, you know, you can... Um, you, know, you can listen in on this Wi-Fi signal. And again, the company just didn't think of setting a strong password on this. So if you find the, the MAC address broadcasting while you're in a hotel or in EMF or anyone else, you can take control of this. You can see what someone is doing with this. You can commit sexual voyeurism, again, that's an offense in this country, with a Wi-Fi connection. Because people don't understand what it is that they're buying. They don't understand that when you buy internet-connected things, you are sacrificing a part of your privacy. And unless you are absolutely on top of all of these things and read every single privacy policy every time they're updated, you could open yourself up to, to a, a huge world of, of pain or embarrassment or blackmail or, or anything. And it gets worse. It, it, it just gets worse and worse. Every time we buy something with an internet connection, it, it sort of eats away at our privacy a little. And no, no one, it, no normal user is reading privacy policies. No normal user is changing their default settings. No normal user is changing their password on their, on their sex toys. Um, it, it just doesn't happen. It just gets worse and worse. Everything is terrible. Everything is absolutely terrible. And I have no idea as a community how we fix it. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>
in a couple of weeks, it's very possible I am going to become a developer of precisely this kind of kit in a startup organization of about 10 people where it's painfully obvious that I am the only one who has the vaguest concept of security. Any thoughts on how to educate the highly intelligent, highly motivated people who have no concept of security in the rest of the organization? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you should. And, you know, kudos for you for, for, for telling them that. I think one of the things that you can do, uh, especially with founders, is show them the fines which people have been given. So, as I said, Vizio, Vizio in, in the States, 2.2 million. I think Cloud Pets uh, had, a, had a big out of court settlement. I can't remember. But showing people the money is good. And I think telling people the stories of privacy. And I remember talking to a developer years ago who's saying, but when people get a new app, don't they just automatically flick through all the settings and see what they like? And I had to say, no, normal people don't do that. Um, what, what I would recommend is doing user testing. So if you've got an app, for example, go down to a coffee shop, get real users and you know, buy them a coffee and say, hey, can you use this app? Tell me what you think and see how many of them read the privacy policy or do things. And I think showing people that there is a monetary problem, there's a society problem, and that their users don't really understand or care. I think that's a good way, but um, I, I'm not sure that it's been successful yet. But uh, yeah, do, do come and chat with me afterwards. Um, any more for any more? Hi, Terence. Hello. Um, are you running a bug bounty on your house? Am I running a? Bug bounty on your house. A bug bounty on my house. Um, yes, yes, I am. Uh, and you get some delicious home-cooked cookies, which unfortunately have been cooked by me and will not be very tasty. So, um, I, but it, it is very interesting. So um, trying to, I, I've got Virgin Media at home and they've got a, you know, their smart hub. And there is no meaningful firewall on that. Um, I think there's a question right at the back there. Um, so it is really hard as a home user to secure your home without buying more and more stuff. I think there's a question there, and then if we've got time for more, yep, and if not, you can buy me a drink. Is this working? Is it all good? Um, I was wondering what you think about this perhaps being a consumer rights issue that our law hasn't really caught up with. I mean, thinking back to even what we see with mobile apps, where something's gone terribly wrong with the software model that we've got, yeah. where users are forced to accept upgrades, as you say, you know, to continue to get functionality, and functionality is taken away. And things like, you know, think about my Sonos speakers, on a you know, monthly basis, forced to accept new software, they change the features, yeah, so I, and I, it's I just think... not possible to install an old version of the yeah. app. And, and a good example is the Nest smoke alarm. So the original Nest that I've got, uh, it touted a feature that if, if the alarm was going off and it was a false alarm, you could stand under it and wave, and it would switch off. And what they discovered was their firmware was unable to tell the difference between a, a person waving under their smoke alarm and black billowing smoke. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're pretty easy to confuse. I can, and so they disabled that functionality. Now, I'm, I'm kind of glad they did, but that's something they've turned off, which I've paid for. At the moment, I don't think there is a, a, a consumer rights movement for that, and I, I don't know how we fix that. Um, I think someone at the back had a question. Hello. Hello. Um, are you as worried about the recording capabilities of mobile phones as you are about Alexa? And if not, why not? So you can usually tell when your phone is recording and when it's transmitting. Uh, it's, it's harder with an Alexa. Um, the mode of a, of a smart speaker is that it's always on. Uh, you don't have to do that with your phone. Um, I, I don't use uh, Google Assistant on my phone or Siri or anything like that. But yes, it is entirely possible that those things um, could be recording and sort of doing stuff. Uh, just while we're getting the next question up, um, I would love to take a selfie with you all because you're all wonderful. So if you could just give a, a big EMF wave, just like that. Consent. Consent? No, it's too late. It's too late. By attending this talk, you give up all rights. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. The, the, uh, yeah. the, the GDPR does not cover my photos. Uh, yeah. Hi, Terence. I, I'm curious what... Uh, devices you've ended up deciding you're okay with having in your own house? Oh, all of these. Uh, <laughs> um, because it's a trade-off. Do, do I really think that Nest are going to sell my, how often I burn toast to, to an advertiser? They might, but I run ad blocks, so, so what do I care? With these cameras, I, I have rooted them, jailbroken them. I'm confident that I am in control of them. Um, I, I no longer have the i3, um, and my new car coming doesn't have a permanent 3G connection, but it still runs Linux. So it, it's a trade-off, and we, we all make these trade-offs. You know, it's, it's like with, as I was saying, with iPlayer. 
I'm, I'm happy to give up a bit of privacy if they make more good episodes of Doctor Who, because they've seen me rewinding, you know, the good ones and watching them again and again. Um, but, you know, your trust model, your failure model might be different, and I wouldn't blame anyone who just went, I'm having no part of this, uh, because, you know, it, it can be quite scary. Um, one more. Yeah. Is there necessarily a trade-off between usability and privacy or security? Yes. Because you, some people, uh, is there a trade-off between privacy and usability? Because you are going to have to ask users questions. Are you okay with this being stored outside of the EU? Are you okay with us doing face recognition from your uh, smart doorbell? And every time you ask a question, that reduces usability. You shouldn't make users think too much about this. But if you give them too much privacy, maybe the utility of what they have isn't good enough. So I, I think there is a real tension here. We want to buy some. I mean, the Nest is great in the sense that you just, you know, stick it up onto the wall, that's it. There's no real configuration necessary. Um, but, you know, that doesn't do much. It just sends you an alert saying your house is on fire. But if you're doing smart doorbells and you want to, you know, record people's faces and send them to seven people and talk about, you know, I, I think that the more interesting a smart home device you have, the more usable it is, then it's going to necessarily be a privacy problem. And trying to get people to understand the privacy trade-offs they're making for themselves, their families, for their friends coming around, for the uh, postie ringing on the doorbell, um, that, that's something that we haven't worked out how to educate people on. Thank you so much for coming to my talk, and uh, I shall see you all in the bar. Cheers.